Hey, CityCast listeners, it's Megan. If you've been to the Strip, gosh, in the last 10 years, you know a lot has changed. And in a lot of ways, the anchor to all that is the Strip District Terminal. The historic five-block building used to be the source for all the produce in Pittsburgh. And now it's an all-day destination for shopping, dining, working out, and more. There's the market on Saturdays, performances on Sundays, parking and retail discounts on Tuesdays. Check it all out for yourself in person person and at stripdistrictterminal.com. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh. What would you do for a Klondike bar? That iconic little ditty first debuted nationwide in 1982, and now there's a contest asking folks to post their most creative answers to Instagram. The company's even coming to Market Square next weekend to promote it, and for good reason, because the history of one of America's most recognizable frozen treats, the Klondike, is very much a Pittsburgh story. It's Thursday, June 29th. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with Brian Butko. He's the director of publications at the Heinz History Center in the Strip District. Brian, you literally wrote the book on the Klondikes and the family behind them, the Isleys. This frozen treat dates back to the 1920s. Yeah, January 1922. For some reason, everyone jumped on the uh, coated bar bandwagon. And the challenge was no one until 1920 could figure out how to put chocolate on ice cream. And... um, a candy wow. maker figured out cocoa butter like you have in chocolates in a box would work on ice cream, too. Um, he patented it. He got a patent in 1922, and perhaps that is what unleashed uh, the interest. And so Isley was one of hundreds of companies in January 1922 uh, to release their bars, although they they called them something different in their Mansfield, Ohio plant. It was the Polar Dainty in uh, Marion, Ohio, it was the Klondike Pie, and Youngstown uh, was just the Klondike. God, the early part of the 20th century was just the Wild West in terms of copyright and trademark. <laughs> yeah, and flavors. You know, we think of wacky flavors today, but uh, they had them then, but they were mostly fruit-based. Fruit-based ice cream, like sorbets? Yeah, just um, that's really the only flavoring they had. So everything from peach to boysenberry they would flavor their ice creams with it, their bricks or their Klondikes. Uh, Caramel was a popular flavor then. Would you eat a boysenberry Klondike? Oh, sure. I don't know what it would taste like, but I would try it. (laughs) So Isley's was this beloved regional chain that sold deli and dairy products, um, especially chip chopped ham. I know a lot of us think about that. Um, And I guess it's kind of a Pittsburgh institution, but I didn't realize it actually started in Ohio and then expanded to here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, they were throughout the region at their peak. They probably hit uh, 400 stores between just Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, When I was a kid, they were like McDonald's. Now every town had one or two or three of them. Yeah, but so like if Klondike was born in Ohio and then moved to Pittsburgh when it was still really young, do you think that that means that it counts as a real Pittsburgher? Well, Pittsburgh, although it can't claim to be where Isley's was founded, um, it certainly became uh, sort of the premier branch. That's where the stores were standardized uh, with the Carrara glass front and then an organized uh, setup where you would have um, the deli case up front and then ice cream and then a little uh, restaurant in back. Everything white, uh, that idea in the 30s, just like White Castle or White Tower showing cleanliness uh, coming out of the 1920s where there were less less oversight, fewer regulations. And um, eventually as the chain in the 1960s collapsed, and began closing stores and plants, uh, Pittsburgh became the ultimate headquarters of the company and the only factory. So um, in that way, it's not wrong for Pittsburghers to love and embrace Isley's. <laughs> well, and I, I read that, you know, for decades, you could really only get Klondike bars 
at an Isley's, first of all, and then only in Ohio and Western Pennsylvania. Um, how What made them hit it big, as it were, go national? Right. Well, it was only another product to them, just like they sold um, ice cream. They called it bricks. Uh, freezers were too small then for half gallons, so it would be the size of a brick. Obviously, bricks were really popular, and they would um, mash up flavors in them. Uh, so Klondike was just like that, just like any other product, but it did sell well. So um, when the family wanted to get out of the business, uh, by the 1960s, the founder, William Isley, had died. Um, his uh, handful of sons died, and now there's 16 or so cousins and um, that's hard for a business by the time it reaches the third generation. So they decide to sell in 1972. And um, those owners were more like an investment firm. The, they wanted to take Isley's Nash, or Klondike National, but the problem is there really wasn't it, a small company really couldn't do that. So they also worked on Isley's had come up with a restaurant chain, Sweet Williams, kind of like Eaton Park today. And for mm-hmm. five years, those investors wavered. They sold out. They took their money and sold. And the new owner, Kleber, named for Henry Clark, uh, knew that Klondike was the thing. And if you think about it, it makes total sense. Instead of having three or four hundred stores with labor and overhead and real estate and stocking it, factories supplying it, and uh, people suing them for slipping on milk or what have you. Instead, you have one factory churning out Klondikes 24 hours a day. And then trucks take them to Giant Eagle and you don't do anything else. So it's heartbreaking (laughs) to see all the Isley stores that closed and how it contributed to the loss of vitality of downtowns. But if you're an investor, uh, it makes total sense to go with that one factory with five workers instead of thousands of workers. Pittsburgh, it's Megan. If you're craving a delicious scoop on a hot summer day, get yourself up to Bakery Square, the new local home for Jenny's ice cream in Pittsburgh. I know, I know, it's sort of sacrilegious here to love an Ohio brand this much, but y'all, I have been a Jenny stand for years. Their flavors are so creative. The brown butter almond brittle, the brambleberry crisp, and they have dairy-free and gluten-free flavors too. Their cold brew one, ugh, it is almost better than actual coffee. And one day, I might even pluck up the courage to try the everything bagel. My friend Laura says it's divine. I'm so stoked that I can finally get my from scratch Jenny's fix right here in Pittsburgh, even at Target, Whole Foods, or Giant Eagle. Find all their flavors and fun facts at Jenny's, that's J-E-N-I-S dot com. This episode is brought to you by FX's The Bear. The hit series returns with Jeremy Allen White in the Golden Globe winning role of Carmi. He and the team will transform their family sandwich shop into a next level spot, all while being forced to come together in new ways as they confront their past and reckon with who they want to be in the future. FX is the bear. All episodes now streaming only on Hulu. Well, in the Klondike itself, the actual bar, um, you know, it's what we eat today, similar to how it would have appeared to customers in, say, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. Yeah, it's uh, a lot smaller now. Like physically, like the square of it is smaller than it used to be? All of it. The square is smaller and um, the coating is a lot thinner. Um, oh. People, one after the other, said in the old days, it truly was like getting a candy bar on your chocolate that you would snap it off. It was so thick. <laughs> Did it have toppings and stuff too, like nuts or crispies or something like that? Yeah. Uh, and the different branches tried different things. But the crispies, which back then was popcorn, uh, was certainly the oh. one that lasted the longest um, until when the new companies bought Isley's. That's all they had to start was regular and the uh, crispy. But what we know today, like the the foil wrapper and all of that, all the same? Yeah, the foil wrapper is the same. The whole idea is the same. I think what has happened, and not to criticize Klondike Company, um, they do a great job with their product, but it's pretty much a middle-of-the-road um, product. So there's premium ice cream treats that cost more. And that's never mm-hmm. what they, the 
the ultimate owner is Unilever, a big food conglomerate. That's not what they're aiming for. They're aiming for something that's affordable, that um, regular working class personal buy, especially when it's on sale for a couple dollars for a six pack. Yeah, Brian, I don't know if you've seen where, you know, with inflation and everything else, folks have been doing like uh, grocery store comparisons, Mm -hmm. like price comparisons of a product over time. Um, I thought this one was so funny that um, when a Klondike would have debuted, if you compare its inflation rate at the time to what it would cost now, you know, just Mm -hmm. doing that adjustment, um, it's barely more now individually than it was in 1922, I guess. Right. Part of the reason it's probably gone down is because the or or stayed in line is because the bars are smaller. But again, I think consumers also uh, demand that. Um, When I first interviewed people for the book, though, one uh, gentleman said that before bed, he would always eat two Klondikes or maybe three. And uh, now, you know, one, one Klondike, even small version is enough. You know, I think we're all wanting or getting used to smaller serving sizes. So uh, I think Klondike knows what they're doing. Although, you know, it's when I uh, started my first book on Isley's Klondike, um, you could still go to sort of a Isley's company and talk to work or the, the management. But now it's pretty much uh, there's the Unilever that makes the decisions on money and there's a PR firm and then there's two factories. So it's really hard. You can't. And I'm sure it's the same with a lot of companies. You can't just go to a Klondike company and ask for help. Um, It doesn't exist. It's an odd thing of modern life. Yeah. Well, what then happened to Isley's? You know, you mentioned they they downsized quite a bit. um, And I think there's at least still one store in operation. Is that right? Uh, No, all the official stores are closed. What is the one on Perrysville Avenue in Westview? So that the Isley company itself that has pretty recent owners and really wonderful people and back making the products like the ice cream um, and chipped ham. They didn't want to be in the restaurant business. Um, They said they would like to open one again and see how it would go. But uh, with that was the last one. And when new people bought it to avoid um, in an agreement to avoid any copyright infringement, you'll notice that the logo on the front, Isley's, has a dot after each letter. I have never noticed that, Brian. (laughs) I've driven by that store hundreds of times. I know. It's pretty tricky. And it refers to a mnemonic that when I used to interview people from the 30s and 40s who worked there, who've all passed on now, um, that's how they used to sign their love letters, uh, I-S-A-L-Y-S, which uh, was a mnemonic for I shall always love you, sweetheart. Well, that's adorable, Brian. Have you ever written a letter and signed off that way? (laughs) Hmm. I have not, but I I might have to start. I have to write a note for my wife tonight. Um, But uh, (laughs) the funniest one was someone, um, a gentleman was proposing to his wife, and out in the snow, he stomped Isley's in his boots. I so always love you, sweetheart. And then when she looked out the window, he proposed to her. Was it that well known that someone could do that, you know, for their sweetheart and they'd, they'd be aware yeah. of that as a mnemonic? Yeah, it was so well known that a lot of people don't realize there's an Isley family because they think it just came from the mnemonic, not that the family came from Switzerland in 1833. Wow. Well, so what happened to the family then? If the stores didn't make it, what, where, where are the, the namesakes? Well, now the, the third generation... Um, is mostly passed on. There's a few of them left. Um, but now the fourth and fifth generation is there, and uh, they're pretty much unaware that Isley's was once the world's largest dairy store company, so they're really interested in it, and it's fun to uh, talk to them and uh, repeat stories that I've heard that they haven't heard, even though their grandparents were running the operation uh, in the 1960s and early 70s. Well, so this contest that's coming to Pittsburgh, um, you know, the national brand wants answers to this classic jingle, um, and they say they want them focused on community. Uh, When you were researching your book, did you see any fun or especially creative responses to that classic question? Well, you know, there's a lot online that um, were a little too racy for my book, 
<laughs> people do a lot of <laughs> fair enough do a lot of naughty things and um so i went for mostly i put some in my book that were mostly goofy thefts almost as if they knew the headline in the newspaper the next day would be what would you do for a klondike bar because um you know they would try and rob a store and they would put it down their pants like the six pack you know or um two guys robbed a house and one carried out all kinds of valuable things and the other carried out a six pack of i think it was reese's klondike bars um so yeah it's it's made its way into pop culture in an odd way do you think anyone here in pittsburgh could win oh yeah i'm sure because they probably have lots of stories because pittsburghers love their klondikes and they've been eating them uh since the 1930s and I feel confident you have probably gotten this question before. Uh, but, Brad, what do you think you would do for a Klondike bar? Oh, oh no, I should have prepared for this. Hmm. I would write, <laughs> I shall always love you, sweetheart, mnemonic to anyone who asks. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Um, I would probably just buy one. I'm pretty boring like that. (laughs) Not boring, just rule abiding. Um, We'll have a link to Brian's book, Klondike's Chipped Ham and Skyscraper Cones, The Story of Isley's. And if you want to see a bit of that Isley's history in person, you can check out the Heinz History Center. They've got this cool playroom for kids with classic soda fountain hats and so much more. We'll have links to it all in our show notes. Brian, thank you again for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Here's what else Pittsburgh is talking about. Speaking of beloved snacks, an Aliquippa man is bringing back the taste of the old snack bar from the Hills department stores. If you don't remember, they operated north of the city from the late 1950s until 1999. Now, this was way before my time here in Pittsburgh, but my friends tell me that Hills was an experience, like a discount one-stop shop, um, better than a Big Lots, but not quite Target and that it had a certain scent, thanks to that snack bar. Well, the Trib reports that Jason Powell has a new food truck, and it'll be paying homage to those sights and smells with an icy machine, nachos, hot dogs, and more. And someone has tracked spin scooter injuries, and there are more of them than we thought. I definitely didn't notice this myself, but when riders sign up to use SPIN for the first time, I guess we're all agreeing to report any accidents or injuries, but it turns out that reporting system has some flaws. Reporter Ann Belzer has filed a right to no request with the city, and she found a long list of serious and life-threatening injuries. SPIN scooters only started operating in the city two years ago, and that pilot period is actually wrapping up tomorrow. The program will have to pause unless state legislators permanently add scooters to Pennsylvania's vehicle code by July 9th. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Let us know if you've got a fun idea for one of our food shows. We serve them up hot every Thursday. We're also on social at CityCastPGH, or you can call or text us. We're 412-212-8893, and we check the line. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. I guess you meant you enjoy the grocery store. Is that right? Oh, I love the grocery Me store. I, I think it's fascinating how everything is organized. Right. Well, I call it my happy place because I get away from email <laughs> and all the pressures of the job.